All right. Well, welcome, friends, to one of our several sporadic conversations that I have with authors that I like, which probably should be the name of a podcast. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we are here today with Vesper Stamper, who is a member of our community. And I'm very happy to have you here, Vesper, to talk about uh, your books, your uh, outlook on life, and just the power of story and, and how it affects you and all kinds of interesting opinions about that. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Um, for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as a writer and as a human being? Yeah. So what, I think before... what is Vesper Stamper? Oh, gosh. Well, Vesper Stamper is really an illustrator. Um, and so in order to tell you about myself as a writer, I have to tell you about myself as an illustrator first, because that's all I ever wanted to be. That's what my degrees are in. That's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. And I fell backwards into writing quite accidentally. So um, I was always the art kid, never the writing kid. I always really stunk at like creative writing prompts and things like that in school. And um, <laughs> everything I wrote was lame, you know, but I journaled a lot and I wrote a lot of poetry and yeah, but I, and songs, you know, like I was a songwriter, but I never considered myself a writer. That was just something that those other people did that were good at it. You know, <laughs> you knew who the writers were in the class and I was not one of them. And so it wasn't until grad school, well, just before grad school that I was, I was doodling. I was drawing this little girl in my sketchbook and all of a sudden I looked at this drawing and I thought, oh, there's a story here. And I just started writing it out. And anyway, long story short, it became a novel and I, uh, I applied for a grant, a travel grant for it. And I went and wrote this novel on, on this little, you know, in this little village on the outer Hebrides of Scotland. And, um, like, like, yeah, like somebody paid me to actually finish this book, you know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's <was> crazy. <laughs> like what? So, um, and that one's not published yet, but when I went to grad school, I, um, I had a book project that was supposed to just be illustrated and, Preferably, we were supposed to create the content for it, you know. And so I started writing this book about the Holocaust, about the post-Holocaust period, because that's what was capturing my attention. I, I grew up in a Jewish home, and there were, I just had a lot of unanswered questions. And uh, long story short, with that one too, that too became a novel. And oh wow, yeah. And so my my picture book agent, um, when I told her I was working on this in grad school, she was like, I don't think I can really place that in the children's market, you know? <laughs> and uh, I was like, no, 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 this is just a grad school project, whatever. And it turns out that this one editor she had spoken to, um, uh, she told her about it and this editor began stalking me. <laughs> and, oh, wow. and that is how I, and, and so she picked up the book and it became What the Night Sings, which was my first published novel wow. in 2018. And I'm still like, are you really sure you want me in your industry? <laughs> because I don't, you know, it's like, I don't really totally understand the young adult genre. Um, I write historical fiction about very dark yeah. stuff like yeah. genocide and totalitarianism. And um, it's really all I'm interested in. Like, I don't think I could really. Um, I couldn't write fantasy, Nicholas. Like I, I don't, it's like, I also realized through that whole process that I'm really, I really don't want to write picture books, which is the whole thing that I got into this to do. Mm. I just want to illustrate them. I don't want to write them. It's a whole other kind of like skill set mm. writing picture books, just like yeah, writing yeah. fantasy to me is like, I don't even know where I would begin, but history for some reason, I don't know, you know, 15, 20 years into my career, it was like, oh, this like really makes sense to the way I think and the things that make me curious and and my illustration as well. It's That's just, it's really fascinating. That's very fascinating because I mean there's so it's a completely not typical story, right? No. Anybody who just who knows anything about publishing, this is simply not how it happens. No. To anybody. <laughs> and I feel a little bit guilty about that. I'm like, I know that there are people, I really know that there are people with like a lot more qualifications than me and a lot more like passion for it even that are like, oh, I got to get an, and I'm just like, 
Well, until luckily, somebody kicks me out, you know. Qualification. <laughs> luckily, it's not about qualification. It's about being able to write a good story, which which you do. Um, Thank your, you. Your book, uh, your your book, uh, the one that I'm reading right now, uh, which uh, cloud about rage is blue. I can never remember that title. It drives me crazy. I don't know why. Don't it's tell my publisher. Great title. I know, right? <laughs> But I swear, it's like it's like I have a blind spot in my brain. As soon as I think about that title, it just disappears. Um, no, it's it's a it's a very riveting uh, story, and and you obviously have have a handle on on how to tell a story, which makes which makes it very interesting to me that uh, you consciously came to the connection between uh, image and story so relatively late, or at least in your conscious mind. So, do you think that that was burbling underneath for a while there, and it was always there, or, or was there an event that pushed it out somehow? I think that actually, I've thought about this recently because getting into writing fiction, you know, you sort of now have to call yourself a storyteller, right? Yeah. And I don't really feel like I am a storyteller in that sense. I mean, every time I sit, every time I have to start a novel, I, I literally have like the Blake, Sch Blake Snyder, sorry, I just wrote a book about Germany. So I'm like Blake Schneider. No, no, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the, the save the cat beat sheet. I've got that thing in like yeah. post-it notes, like all up all over the wall. I really need a lot of like scaffolding to do this because I yeah. like that part of it. I'm like, I don't know. I'm really a storyteller. I don't know. But, um, I think that more, I think that actually the way that I approach story is as a poet because yeah. that's the way that I approach my illustration as well. It's, it's very similar because, you know, there are like these superstar illustrators and I don't know if your audience would know any of these names, but like John Hendricks, Yuko Shimizu, like these absolutely stellar draftsmen, like they are um, Kirby Rosales is another one who's just like, oh my gosh, I could, I, I try, I aspire to draw that well. And I think I do draw well, but that's not my concern. What they're doing in terms of like super mechanical, like perfection and, and like, that's actually not my concern. My concern yeah. is with metaphor and space and atmosphere and emotion. And I think you can see that in a cloud of outrageous blue, yep. but that's kind of the way that I'm approaching things is like, really trying to portray the inner life of the of the character like the the sort of metaphoric or poetic inner life of that character as opposed to yeah. here's the storyboard here's the cinematic you know kind of like setting and all you know what i mean well and I, I think that yeah it's interesting that you divide those two because i i think that what you're talking about when you're talking about story is simply technique um or maybe not simply technique but it's, it's it's the thing that doesn't come so naturally to those of us uh, who are naturally gifted, um, who learn how to appreciate and tell stories at a young age. Um, but the metaphorical underpinning, the poetic um, the poetic soul of a thing, that's no less story than save the cat. Wouldn't what you, do you agree? What do you mean? I mean the. The essence of the story is 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 that metaphorical poetic impulse. Uh, yeah. It's not the scaffolding. The scaffolding is merely is merely a, a uh, wind, window dressing to help. It's actually more for the reader than it is for the writer. Right, right, and that's true. Yeah, I I think that um, I think because I'm a visual, uh, I'm primarily visual. The concept of scaffold, well, I guess I have my own scaffolding, right? Or I have my yeah. own oh, tool, that, you know, yeah. that maybe maybe it's over years of training, maybe it's what comes yeah. naturally as a visual thinker, but it's like, I think in terms of contrast and lighting mm -hmm. and, and, you know, value and color and, you know, and these things are like very, imp yeah, they're very impressionistic. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I see what but you're saying, yeah. they are my visual scaffolding. And yeah, yeah. because I because they are like my first language, right? Because that's where I am like naturally gifted. It's effortless for me, you know? Yeah. I, I know how to wield those things just like I know how to push paint around on a paper, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
but that's not going to do a whole lot for the reader if I'm just like writing these impressionistic sentences or something, you know? And right. so, so that's where I still feel like, oh gosh, maybe I should really go to some writers conferences <laughs> or like, maybe I need another MFA in writing or I should. Oh gosh, no, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah, no. Actually, they probably wouldn't have me. I, I, I've read a few <laughs> things about those MFAs, but, but I have thought about going back for a history PhD. Mm. I don't well, know. Well, what is history except scaffolding told through story, right? Correct. <laughs> we'll talk more about history later. But I want to talk more, I want to tease out more this this idea of, of how to tell story and how story can come out inside us and how we transmit it to others. Um, so I'd like to know if there was an early experience other than that initial moment light bulb moment when you connected visual image with story was there an early experience in your life where you learned that the act of storytelling or books or story in general had had special power absolutely absolutely so i was very i was a very early speaker a very early talker and a very early reader so i was reading at age two and the stories that really made a difference for me were fairy tales. Yeah. And when I grew up, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, you had these very long form storybooks, mm. you know, that were like highly illustrated, highly yeah. detailed. They weren't these 32 page quick yeah. turnaround things. They were like thousands upon thousands of words. And yeah. um and I you even can't had make those some, anymore. So annoying. No, no, it's I so know. Annoying. Well, actually we can talk about that because I'm trying to bring that back. With what ah, I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. All right. But um, so I even had these readers, like school readers, and I don't know why I had them in my house because they weren't from my grade or anything like that. And I was the first child in the family. Like I had, I had a big extended um, family, single mom and a teenage mom. And um, so somehow these books like found their way into my house and they were like Native American myths and African myths and Grimm's tales and all the, and they were scary and, and dark. And, um, and, and so what, what I wound up doing with those, well, I read them over and over and over and over. I wasn't interested in amassing like a huge collection of, of books, even as a young, young kid, I would read that same reader or like the blue fairy book or something like that yeah. again and again and again. And I would do drawings either, either I wasn't illustrating the stories I was reading. I was making up my own and, but they had the same kind of conceits, you know, it would be, it would be like, um, you know, a queen who disguises herself and, you know, goes down and, and lives among the peasantry and then like reveals herself to be the queen later. And, you know, these, but I was drawing those things that like, I was drawing those things at like three, four, five That's years amazing. old. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So those were my, my concerns at that age, you know? And mm -hmm. um, I had this book of um, Hillary Knight who el illustrated Eloise, but I didn't know anything about El Eloise. I had his Cinderella mm -hmm. and I copied that book again and again. I would just like sit down and try and, you know, at this, like, when it was like six or seven just trying to copy like how he drew a hand or yeah. a wing or a gown or something like that. And um, it was just trying to unlock the mysteries of, of why these things were so beautiful and moved me and entranced me so much, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I really lived in those stories. Cause I, I also, like I mentioned, I, I had a single mom who, it, who was a teenager and um, I had a very broken childhood and those stories really felt, I felt a kinship mm. with, with those stories. I felt like I was living in them and that they were part of my world and that they were showing me the way forward. Interesting. So, yeah. okay, I'm going to probe that a little bit okay? Um, because this is an interesting topic that I've been thinking a lot about. So if you're, this is going to recall, this is going to require some adult recall of childhood reality, which is necessarily going to be, you know, biased and probably not entirely uh, accurate. Still, we're going to sure. do this. Um, what was it about the stories that, um, 
that you think helped get you through the difficulties? Was it a sense of um, the stories providing for a moral, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, was it because the stories that you liked were always provided the poor and the downtrodden with unexpected uh, joys? Or was it because the good got rewarded and the bad got punished? And this is a very leading question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain in a second why. <laughs> Give me those two categories again. So one is the the downtrodden hero gets an unexpected uh, source of wealth or or salvation of some kind. And the other one is the good get, uh, the virtuous get um, rewarded and the, and the evil get punished. I think it was the latter. Interesting. Yeah, I think it was the latter because I'm, spe I'm specifically thinking of this uh, Native American retelling of Cinderella. Yeah, well, Cinderella is the famous one for that one, yeah. Right. And in that one, it, it's not really stepsisters, but it's like the other villagers, you know, like they burn her face and they, you know, they really mistreat her. And, um, but she's the only one that can see the chief. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not, I wouldn't necessarily have put it in terms of morality. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tell as much as, as much as almost like blessed are the poor in spirit or something like okay. that, you know, okay. or like, very, very interesting. Yes. you know, like it, where yeah. it's, it's the humble, it's the, Slightly it's the unseen. Foolish. Yeah. Like I really identified with those simpleton characters. Yeah. Okay. Big time, big time. Yeah, that's, re that's really interesting because, okay. So uh, if you have a chance and time, I do recommend that you uh, listen to Malcolm Gladwell's retelling of the little mermaid. It's a three episode long um, extravaganza on his uh, podcast called revisionist history. Yeah. And it's his retelling is awful. It is, monumentally horrifically bad it's really 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 bad we can talk about that in a second but oh, i want to know what you think is david and goliath but we won't go there okay uh, i haven't listened to it i'll have to listen to it oh no that's his famous one okay but anyway go ahead well you can tell me about it i'm i'm not up on my gladwell to be honest i just know that he's okay. famous i know that he's got the the ten thousand hour rule and i know the ten thousand hour, hour rule is nonsense but, but anyway back to what we're talking about here which is uh, he actually traces some of the history of of fairy tales as they were transmitted in the Western tradition. And uh, because before the Enlightenment age, uh, fairy tales tended to be tended to follow um, this kind of model that you that you describe in the model that that is uh, frequently found in Russian fairy tales, which is the unexpected grace given to those who don't necessarily deserve it. Uh, sometimes they're even bad characters, but more often than not, they're either fools or unlucky or poor in spirit or downtrodden or in some way uh, marginalized or outcast. Uh, it's not about uh, a strict moral uh, equation where uh, he who he who does good things must receive ben benefits at the end as a, as a kind of perfectly classic, classicist uh, Newtonian um, version of of uh, cosmic recompense um, that became popular with Pierrot and and what and his retellings right. of the old fairy tales, which he changed. He changed the stories to include that that cosmic balance. Um, and what's the reason I'm mentioning this? Because there was uh, there is a living folklorist uh, who is a an expat from Scotland. I can't remember his name right now. I'll look, I'll look it up later for those who are interested. But um, he does uh, studies about um, folklore transmission in the modern world. Now, I think some of his ideas are a little bit wonky. But he, he has this uh, super secret method of uh, measuring children's interest in a story as it's being told. He refuses okay. to say what the method is, <laughs> um, uh, which oh, no. makes me think that it might all be nonsense <laughs> and it probably involves some some form of brain scanning um, which is um, you know it, it's a limited way of, of actually measuring anything but uh, 
by the way, pandemic reality, there are like 5,000 people in the next room. So you're going to occasionally going to hear Same. sounds of great If you hear joy. like doorbell sounds and yeah. Uh, totally. I think we're all, we, we're so far in the pandemic that we're all okay with this. So I'm, it, it's I'm not just pandemic reality, but it's, it's also the yeah. fact that I'm, I'm at my in-laws house because I don't have power <laughs> at home. So I, this, I'm in a space that's not my own. I don't really love. <laughs> <laughs> no, not my favorite flavor, but it, it's fine. <laughs> Nobody can hear me say that. It makes for a nice backdrop. Okay. So, so anyway, the, uh, this, um, this folklorist could actually tell based on his super secret method, which he will not talk about that children prefer the, um, the stories of the downtrodden having unexpected grace much more than the, the classical Cinderella, not the classic, classicist Cinderella thing. They, yes. Their eyes glaze over. They don't like retri divine retribution or cosmic balance. Children don't like it. <laughs> okay. So, thank you for saying that because, okay. Somebody, a very well-meaning friend sent me recently a link to a children's book that a conservative uh, group had published. Uh-huh. And he was like, isn't this, I'm not a conservative, I'm, I'm completely independent, but the, <laughs> the, the, the guy was like, isn't this awesome that like the conservatives are getting into the children's book business? And I saw this uh -huh. thing and I was instantly like, I can tell you exactly what's in that book. And I don't want to look at the googly eyes. And, yeah. um, and I'll bet it has a really good moral at the end. Uh -huh. And I yeah. just like... I hated to kind of go off on him, you know, <laughs> but I can't stand it. Like, and yeah. you know, um, as an illustrator, I will get, you know, on a pretty regular basis, I'll get some email saying, Hey, I have this great idea for a children's book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh -huh. and could you illustrate it for me? And it's usually like, I have a budget of like a hundred dollars and I want it to be 50 <laughs> pages long. And I'm like, no, like, no, go away. <laughs> Um, but it, but it's always like, oh, it has a great moral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't understand. Are these adults, are they so disconnected from yes. children? They're, they're disconnected from their own childhood. From their own childhood. And so, okay. So I start teaching at school of visual arts in the fall, actually next week. Ah, and one of the I things that I am so excited about doing is reacquainting my students with the old stories because so many of them have it in their head this same thing like and it, you see it in all of the the um these new children's books picture books like that are activist mm -hmm. yeah. and oh, yeah. and in my oh. genre in young adult oh. fiction it's so moralistic yeah and it's yeah. so off-putting it's like you can smell it from a mile propaganda. away it's, it's, it's total problem. propaganda and nobody, nobody wants to read it. It's, it's so tiresome. Well, only the only people who do want to read it are people who just want to reinforce their same points. They're, they're not in it for the story. No. You know? And like, anyway, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, this is a safe space to talk about that. Kind of thing, so we'll talk about that more but let's sure. let's get back into into the power of stories and yes. i want to delve delve a little more deeply into the idea of story and trauma so um you write about trauma a lot yes um, it's as you've as expressed to me privately it's one of the reasons why um some of your books have been uh not selling as well as perhaps you would like is because uh you're a, a cloud of outrageous blue which is about the great play came out right in time for um, uh, the great other plague of, of 2020, mm -hmm. um, which just means the, that give it a year. The plague that year, shall we'll not be named. <laughs> right. We can't talk about it. Yeah. There are, actually, there's several plagues going on at the same time, but we'll, we don't need to talk about that. True. Um, plagues of the mind. Yes. As well. Yes. The worst mm -hmm. kinds of plagues. Yes. So what is it about trauma and and its importance in storytelling for you. Um, why do you, why is it that you lean into it so strongly? All right. Well, it made a lot of sense to me when I was writing What the Night Sings that a, a question I had always been asking in my work, even in my illustration work, was, was about trauma and what caused one person to survive and one person to thrive after trauma, because this was my own story. Um, 
you know, my life was not set up for success in any way, shape or form. Um, it, it, not just the things that happened to me, but because I was an extremely angry person. Yeah. And it was only um, the, the saving grace of God. When I was 16 years old, I became a Christian. And yeah. th that is what I was, you know, saved from really was my anger. And yeah. um, it, it now had a place to go. And yeah. So, and, and so the rest of my life from that point really pivoted and I, I am definitely one of those simpletons that's been shown undeserved grace. I mean, I, I, I we could talk for hours about it. It's, I, I really, um, I, I am constantly amazed by it. I, it makes me cry all the time still, you know? Um, but I really, I, I, um, it wasn't that I tried to talk myself into being, you know, overcoming victimhood or anything like that. I, mm. it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't so conscious, you know, pull myself up by my own bootstraps or, you know, but, you know, both a combination of like the grace of God and um, making some good choice, making different choices, you know, than my family of origin made. I did have a different outcome. Yeah. And so this, but, but a lot of it was just, it was like really despite myself, you know? And yeah, so probably. this question, yeah, it, you know, and so this question of like, well, yeah, why does somebody, somebody collapse under the weight of their, of their trauma? And I'm talking trauma, like not trauma, yes, like Instagram yes. trauma, you know? Yeah. Or I'm talking about like, oh my gosh. I'm talking about like capital T trauma, you know, childhood trauma. And um, so this is something I was just always trying to hash out. But as I've written now, I'm, I'm about to complete my third book. That's not really the interesting question to me anymore. Yeah. I forget the origin of your question. Just um, throw it back to me again. The why is it that you lean into into trauma so strongly? Into trauma. In your, in, okay, yeah. it's root. It's rooted in that question, yeah. but I think that um, it's expanded outward to try to understand mass psychology and why people wind up participating in atrocity. Mm -hmm. what what gets a person there and that really that's that's really at the crux of this new book that i'm working on which is a sequel to what the night sings or it's a spin-off from what the night sings mm -hmm. and the whole thing has to do with reckoning with the past one's own culpability radicalization you know um and the berlin wall uh going up in 1961 tell really shows that that reality um, you mm -hmm. know, sort of going from one totalitarian movement to another. Yeah, yeah. And and how how can a population have just just emerged from this mm -hmm. and then go right back into it in a in a different way, you know? Mm -hmm. So um and but but the at the heart of all of those questions, it's it's always children that get the brunt of it. Yeah. From that's the thing for me is like children are always the first to pay for the horrible ideas of adults. And it's amazing how willing adults are to use children as their political pawns. Yeah. So the fact that I write for young adults, I didn't choose it. It really, it really found me, but I find like unending interest in that, um, in just in the historical reality, but also the present reality of how children are so manipulated and so yeah. used and and it, it is it's so abusive you know yeah it's, um, it's really it's really striking uh, to make that that to draw that comparison between that time period and this one um especially since when you're within it it's it's difficult to say it's when you always when you look at it from the outside then it's very easy to point your finger and say well well how why did you do that you horrible people but when you're inside of it when you're in the middle of it it doesn't look anything like what it will in in 10 5 to 20, 100 years. Yeah. Yeah, and I think so a lot of it is, you know, um, sorry, I'll just put a, a point on this, is that yeah. um, 
the, a lot of why people fall into these movements is because slowly they come to believe that they are good people. They're, they're, yeah. They yeah. are the good people. They are, they're saving humanity, you know, little by little by, by, and it's, you know, it's always by shaming your neighbor or, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. making them seem like the bad, like the bad guy and whatever. And so we are what seeing are the, cross, the process of other or otherization or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's what, that's what the technical term is. But it, but it is this, so like here, this need to be good. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's really interesting because, okay. So this is, this is very, it's a good, this is a good technical point for, for those who are interested in being writers. This is what makes good villains is villains who are convinced entirely of their rightness. That's exactly and, right. Because, but what's interesting about that though, is that the old fairy tales don't have uh, self-righteous villains. The villains there are darkness incarnate without any sort of qualms about it. Hmm. And it's interesting. It's an entirely different worldview. So here's, here's my question to you. Then you clearly have, a connection, your a hard connection to the fairy tale tradition, but what you're writing is harsh real realism in historical context. Where d does the fairy tale worldview, does the fairy tale um, paradigm intersect with harsh reality in any way in, in your writings? Do you mean? I mean, specifically with reference to your, to your children, to your children, main characters. So is the escape then from harsh reality, something like a return, however, however fleeting to, or an escape, however fleeting to a fairy tale realm? I'm not sure I would articulate it that way but I will say, just thinking of my own protagonists, that there mm -hmm. is an element in each of them where they do choose a kind of magical thinking mm -hmm. in the positive sense. Yeah, yeah. They choose to embrace a larger reality than the one that has been apparently given to them as the only possibility yeah. in which they can exist. I think there's something very, I think there's something very profound about that. About, and and I think that I think that a lot of people would consider that to be a a um, looking at it from a purely realistic, from a purely materialistic point of view. I think a lot of people would consider that to be a a, a bad way to to deal with the trauma. It's it's a it's a a hiding or a covering of the reality. A a kind of putting it too deep so the neuroses start coming out or something like this. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I think that's not true. I think I think that Tolkien was saying something very profound when he was saying you can't uh, resent the prisoner, his escape uh, into into fairy, um, especially when mm -hmm. the world is so terrible around you. And in fact, that there, there might be the great wisdom is in adopting a kind of magical thinking, a kind of yeah. a thinking that encompasses uh, realities that are invisible. Therein lies the great wisdom of the child who suffers during oh God, historical Jesus. times. <laughs> but we it's are true, recording right? this, right? Okay, because yeah, I'm gonna. Absolutely. I'm I'm learning. I yeah, I'm learning in real time from what you're saying. It is so true. And and I'll just say, like in this crazy making year and a half, yeah. um, for all of us, right? We we we've all tried to find our ways to kind of integrate what's going on and like yeah. figure out a way forward. Well, so <laughs> I can't escape, you know, because I do believe in God and I do believe in a very involved God. Um, the fact that in early 2015, when I started writing what the night sings, and it was just like something that was stirring in my spirit. It was my point of curiosity. It had nothing to do with what I was being told to care about. Yeah, yeah. I started learning about, you know, the the roots of anti-Semitism, and literally, like two weeks later, the shootings at Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket in Paris happened, Ouch. and you started to see all of this anti, like the veil being lifted, 
right? On, mm -hmm. on all this global anti-Semitism growing. And finally, the, you know, the news was covering it. And the Atlantic had a cover about, you know, is it time for the Jews to leave Europe? On the Atlantic, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that comes out. And then it was like, you know, in the Tree of Life shooting and all of that. All right, so there's that. And then I start writing A Cloud of Outrageous Blue just because I'm interested in it, just because I love the yeah. Middle Ages and I love learning about synesthesia and all of this stuff. And, and I'm writing it and I hand in the manuscript in January of 2020, yeah. two weeks before the announcement of the, <laughs> the Wuhan virus. Yes. <laughs> and and I, I proceed to watch all of 2020 unfold exactly yeah. mapping yeah. on to my book. Yeah. Yeah. Down to power grabs and even how people got through it through creativity and, you know, yeah. and quarantines and lockdowns. And okay, so that's crazy. So then I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm really interested to know what happened to all the Nazis <laughs> after the war. And you know what? I feel like I just really want to write this book, of, like a retelling of Cain and Abel. And I want it to be uh -huh. about the Berlin Wall going up. Well, the whole year that I've been writing this book since last August, I will read something in a research book yeah. and the next week it's in the news. <laughs> so what do I do with that? Yeah, it doesn't. Okay. Well, you just keep doing it. Just doing it. You're a prophet. You can help it. <laughs> I don't, well, I keep doing it and, but it's making me crazy and it's, and it is yeah. wounding my soul and it has, it has really done yeah. a number on my soul. I feel there are sometimes I feel like I don't want to continue living and I, Guys, I'm not suicidal. Right. Don't worry. You, you don't have to worry about me. Yeah. But it's just like uh, it's more like this. How long, oh Lord? How long do I have yeah. to do this? Another forty years? My God, you know. So if I'm going to so, do this another forty years, and I'm talking about like life, not just writing, yeah. Yeah. then I have to find a mechanism in my brain. And the only thing, the only way I can think to proceed and keep my sanity is um to pursue beauty mm -hmm. well what is that about what is that except magical thinking because really yeah. like the world would tell you that the way to solve these things is that everybody gets the you know what yeah and then everything That's will be solved <laughs> of a different okay kind. <laughs> it's like whatever you think about that i i don't you know i'm not selling telling you to think one way or the other about it but it, but it's just like that's not going to solve the problem, guys. There's the problems go so much deeper. So, so what are you going to do about it? What do you have control over? Well, I have control over um, going to Vespers at five p.m. on Saturday and just like letting that wash me and living yeah. in that space where it has it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. You know, well, so, so this is really so. So, pursuing beauty is also pursuing a person, and this is something that yes, that people outside of of Christianity don't understand. They think beauty is right. an abstract concept, or it's something that's that is born inside of you, and that is a purely solipsistic experience. It's not. It's it's a person, and pursuing it Absolutely. is pursuing a person. So it's a it's an act of love. It's an act of self uh, self sacrifice. It's an act of kenosis. It's an act of abandonment of self, and only in that can you then. Uh, have the synthetic moment of beauty coming together with creativity to make something that is, in your case, prophetic. Um, so my, I had this question, and now I understand why I had it because I didn't, it didn't, I don't know where it came from. But the question then uh, I wrote down before we, before I even started talking to you is there. I think there is a connection between tra exploring trauma creatively and discovering a gift. Uh, that you have and that you can give. And I think that happens to your characters. And I think now you're telling me it's happening to you. So um, what's what's up? What's the deal? What is the connection between trauma and gift? Is, is gift, can gift only happen as a result of trauma? I don't know because I am somebody who grew up with trauma. So I don't know what it's like to not <laughs> have that experience. Um, but this far out from it, and it's not like it all stopped when I was a child or anything like that. I mean, I've had like multiple things. Um, but I can look back over 
those things as a healed person mm-hmm. and say, these things absolutely needed to happen in order for me to love life as much as I do. And I know I just said that I was weary of it, no, <laughs> but, it but both, actually, both <laughs> yeah, both are true. Um, oh, I was like, what happened? You just <laughs> went dark. Um, <laughs> well, there's four children jumping at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thing that, um, the things that I'm grateful for now and the thing that, um, the gift that I'm finding right now, like as it's difficult. Okay. And I know this has happened for all of us, but I, but I'm feeling it for me, you know, personally is that, okay. I'm like an extrovert. Okay. And I, I need a social life and I'm from New York and, um, a year and a half in now, this is like so grating that I, I just, I, but my life has gotten really, really small. And in my studio, I I look over a garden that I put in during quarantine. And the, the gifts that I'm finding now from that are not this like, oh, I'm creating the garden of my dreams and I get to do all these projects. And like, no, it's like, it's stuff like, look at the sunlight on that leaf. And it's stuff like, I actually know how to mix that color. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Like I could sit that's here pre- right now and, and that's presence. That's being in the moment in the yeah. present moment. That's something that modern people don't know how to do. Also, I wouldn't know how to do it if you said you need to be present. I really hate that stuff. Oh, like yeah. I, I I actually now that you just said that, I realize I bristle every time somebody tells me to like practice gratitude or like be yeah, present God. or I'm just like how vapid I can't <laughs> you know I can't do it yeah. no absolutely but it, it but it is about a small life and I was just talking to a book club last night um where they were like why you know why do we feel this struggle it was uh, artists you know and they were like why do we feel this struggle as artists and I'm like it's modernity yeah. uh, you know life has made th- this has made your life you think that your life is supposed to be bigger than it is. Your yeah. life is, you're supposed to, most people like until about a hundred years ago lived a very small life. And I think that the gift in all of this right now, even though it's wrong, right? It's wrong yeah. that they're doing this to us, but yeah. it's also like, oh my gosh, life is getting so small, small enough that you can sit there and watch the light play on a, on a flower petal. And, and it's yeah. like, revelatory to you yeah and it's also it also leaves us who are who are able to for whatever reason catch those moments of illumination it leaves us with the responsibility of illuminating this moment and moments afterwards yeah and not just and not just criticizing what on the one hand or allowing it to dissipate inside ourselves on the other because the other the flip side of all this smallness is that because smallness is all fine and good. Rootedness is wonderful. Presence is fantastic. But if we think that it's merely that, that's that will make us similar to, to our forebears who were more rooted, more, more present or whatever, we're wrong because we have the internet and <laughs> we have access to the internet Inescapable. At, yeah. at, a, at a moment's notice and, mm-hmm. and it niggles at us and we can't avoid it. So do you, do, how do you deal with that ever present reality? Does it impinge on your creativity? Does it impinge on your life? What do you need to do to limit its effect, uh, to allow for that for that illumination that seems to be coming through you to continue? Right. So I'm terrible at this, and I'm so Me aware too. of it. <laughs> um, and I, and I'm aware of like I can I can chart like the destruction of my creativity from when I got my first cell phone. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it just killed like, but I mean, it has had benefits, right? I mean, like, I really wish that I had had Etsy when I was in college, I could have put myself yeah. through college because I was always making stuff then, you know, and gosh, I could have sold it. What, you know, Yeah. and people yeah. actually cared about, you know, the clothes I was sewing back then. Anyway, that's mm-hmm. a tangent, but, um, it, it, so part of the, like, difficulty about this is that because I write historical fiction and because I'm aware of the fact that 1961 is mapping itself onto 2021 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's very hard for me to unplug from the news and from headlines and from commentary and from, because I want to understand, right? So I don't just read the headlines. Like I do listen to commentators and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And, and, um, so I unsubscribed from the Atlantic because <laughs> they're oh, crazy. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I unsubscribed well, from even crazy. their headlines. They used to be fantastic, but, um, I yeah. basically like, I'm down to one or two publications that I, that I think are actually like doing real journalism. Okay. So simplifying, uh -huh. simplifying the, the track of information and, yeah. um, you know, but what am I trying to do? I'm trying to pursue paths of peace. That's mm -hmm. been my go-to word for this, for 2021 mm -hmm. is, is peace, pursuing paths of peace, joy, love, connection mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say I have any like fantastic like advice in terms of discipline it's just like yeah. it's that awareness in the moment of like okay just shut the laptop just yeah. press pause on the podcast like you know um go take a walk outside go out in the garden don't take your airpods with you um mm -hmm. it, it really is kind of like beating back an addiction it um, is you know but I, th this book that I'm writing on writing right now, um, I've written under extreme duress. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, it's hard for me to just go right in a bubble or something like that because yeah. no, I it's, do, it's I need to understand. Yeah. yeah. But it, but it, especially because I do need to understand yeah. how this is playing out in our own time. I have to understand that or I'm not going to be able to yeah. communicate what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, and and since you're doing it in storytelling form, you have to be you have to be so aware that, that you don't do it in that way that the other young adult novelists are doing, presenting yeah. it like propaganda, but allowing Correct. the story to speak for itself. And yeah. that, that that can be very difficult when when it's when it's happening right at the moment. It's when crazy. you're in the middle of it all. Like literally down to the sentences that I'm hearing from people. <laughs> the the words, yeah, like the vocabulary it. and and this this <laughs> you wanna hear what I did? Um, mm -hmm. this, this is actually a little, uh, uh, an exercise in like being able to purge myself of the crazy, um, yeah. is, uh, whenever you get into a propagandistic movement, there's only a vocabulary of say 15 words, right? Yeah. That's fair. And that's fair. <laughs> it's, it's the same in the Holocaust, the Nazis did it. it like yeah. you can go to the center for Jewish history in Manhattan and they, they have a whole wall of like Nazi euphemisms. Right. Yeah. And there's like, oh, the Soviets did it, like totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And and we're seeing even the same words like imperialism, yes. colonialism, yeah. like you know, settler colonialism, all of these things. Okay, those are they have an origin. Well, anyway, what I did was I got myself a set of Legos. And on each Lego, I wrote one of those words. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I play a little game where I just kind of like make in, interlocking like phrases and sentences with the Legos. I like and it, it just it's makes me laugh. And it it reminds me that actually these people have no control over my life. No, that's they great. Know, they have like, no control over my mind, you know. No, it's true. Except that's probably what they do too when they're creating their their euphemistic phrases. It's just is just putting Legos together, random words, and then making it mean something. Which that is, is what showing. they're doing. And if you listen to it, you're like, oh my gosh, you have no thoughts of your yeah. own. It's crazy. No, no. But I will say this, and maybe um, so one of the things that has really um, been drawing me, or I've I've been very attracted to orthodoxy, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was when I went to divine liturgy last year, actually it was, it was before COVID actually, um, yeah. went with my family and, um, befriended the priest there. And he actually, um, really helped me a lot with the cloud of outrageous blue. It was very generous. And, okay. um, there was something about the divine liturgy that was, like I said earlier, nothing about it was about me. Yeah, it was right. so completely other. It was just like, here I am in a space of God's majesty and mm -hmm. it's not seeker sensitive. It's two freaking hours long. Um, I'm not even, uh, that's short. <laughs> that's short. 
Okay. <laughs> Maybe they were rushing through. I don't know. But like, I'm not even allowed to take the Eucharist, which I love the Eucharist. Like the Eucharist is the whole point of church for me. And um, we've been trying to find a church and it's like all, all the places we visit only give it once a month. And I'm like, ah, I'm going to die, you know? <laughs> um, so, but just being able, but I think especially as an artist and a visual thinker, just being able to sit in that visual environment and that sensory environment that reminds me that it's not just about this screen in front of me that has no, there's no sensory input in there. It's yeah, completely that, flat. Well, that that's what makes all, all these, um, you know, streaming services so, so horrifying. And, and mm -hmm. that's what, that's what, that's what really disturbs me in the immediate reaction that I see amongst people of different Christian confessions mm -hmm. who have basically become pajama, pajama pant wearing of uh, spectators of a flat screen. Yeah. Instead of jammy worship, church. Yeah. And uh, they'll be the first to admit it and they, they feel bad about yeah. it, but they're not going to change anything. Some of them don't feel bad about it. Some of them are like, this is the best thing to ever happen to me. Now I can just yeah. sit here with my coffee and feel cozy and, you know, listen to a good pep talk. And we've just forgotten that the whole point of that whole thing is multi-sensory worship of the creator. It's not yeah. about me. It's about taking everything that I have and offering it as a sacrifice. There is no sacrifice in pajama wearing. <laughs> oh, it, I mean, my husband today just read in Oswald Chambers, um, like a complete refutation of self-actualization, right? This thing we're hearing about, like yeah. the, the, the self-actualizing yeah. thing goes hand in hand with deconstruction, right? And oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And and yeah. what Chambers was saying is that no, it's it's, completely about self-abnegation like that is a, because um god is trying to make us more and more like christ and yeah. christ was the ultimate picture of self-abnegation that's right okay yeah. you know but it but what's such a paradox about it is that oh my gosh like in becoming that we get to experience all this beauty and we get to be fully embodied and fully human and fully alive and and like and, and fully ourselves fully ourselves what? what i know it's true <laughs> it's incredible yeah it's that is That's a right. gift yeah yes and that also that gift impossible without sacrifice which is a kind That's of trauma. right that's or right. it should be a kind of trauma if, if you don't feel a bit of trauma when you're sacrificing you're not really sacrificing that's right yeah that's for this is a this is an intensely fascinating conversation and it's it's uh it's been an hour and i need to wrap it up and I don't want to. So I think we can have to do this again. <laughs> Anytime. Uh, yeah. So um, the, we have a few people hanging around. If you guys want to ask a question or two before we uh, sign off, please do. Uh, I should be able to receive comments on this thing. Um, so do, but uh, yeah, there's a lot here. This is a really rich conversation and I wish we could explore it you know, for, for a long time. And I think we, have, we will have to at some point again. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would definitely say if any of your um, listeners would like to engage with my books, um, you know, I'm not just saying that to, to plug them or anything, but like uh, one of the most rewarding things for me as an author is just to hear how people are, are receiving them. And, um, you know, if it's, if it's kind of intersecting with your own journey, that, that means a lot to me. Um, so you can find them anywhere. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to do this anyway, but since you led me to it, um, oh. why don't you tell us what is the best way uh, to find your books and what would you prefer us uh, to do? Um, I always encourage people to go to their local bookstore and if they don't have it in stock, you, you can just order it through them. Um, you can get them online wherever. Um, I'm published through Knopf, so it's like easy to find stuff. Um, uh, yeah, and... I'm pretty accessible. I'm I'm really on Instagram only. I'm not on Facebook or Twitter. I dumped those. Um, or you can write to me directly through my website, you know, but I, I would love to know, you know, if you do read the books, how how they if they help. Um, and especially if you have teens, um, I can say that, you know, there's a lot of books out there that um don't necessarily have your kids' best interests at heart. And <laughs> that, that's being nice about it. <laughs> um, you, very well intentioned people, but um, yeah, but yeah. I really I want to be a helper to families 
who are trying to navigate through t- the teenage years. Um, I have teenagers myself, so. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, they're, it's actually been great. Good, good. They're, God. they're fantastic people. Good. Well, you yeah. did something right. <laughs> <With> God's grace. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so also I want to offer this, uh, uh, to the mem- to my Patreon members, we do have our Discord service. So if you want to ask uh, Vesper anything on the general channel, please feel free to, uh, especially if you're listening to this when it's not live. Uh, I know some of you are in different time zones, so you're not able to be here live. Uh, and when this does go out lo- uh, to the wide community, um, feel free to contact me or Vesper about uh, anything you like. We'd be happy to chat with you all. Great. Vesper, this has been a long overdue and much delayed pleasure <laughs> and uh i'm not just being uh cursorily nice when i say we need to do this again absolutely anytime sounds good all right